All right. Well, good morning again. I'm back from the bumper video. Uh, it's I, I missed you guys last week. I missed hang, I missed being here. But Pastor Phil was here. I was up with the men at the men's retreat. We had a great time. Just a word to the wise: next year when we have our men's retreat, don't sign up late. If you sign up, if you're the last person to sign up, you have to go ask Douglas. Douglas is in the back sound booth. Douglas, wave your arm back there. He's working the cameras. You go ask Douglas what happens when you're the last man to sign up late. And that's all I'm going to say. You got to talk to him. He'll tell you. Anyhow, uh, this week was Veterans Day. And uh, I've got a special place in my heart. I told you probably my very first Sunday. For whatever reason, I'm a guy who enjoys war history and all that. There's something about somebody who will step in to uh, that place of um, danger on behalf of others that draws me to that. And it's very interesting to me. So I just thought we would just take a second and thank those who are veterans here at REC. And I don't know who is and who isn't, but if you're a veteran, would you mind standing up so we could just honor you this morning? Thank you. Thank you for your service. You may be seated. I'm, I'm standing up, but I'm not a veteran. <laughs> I just preach here. Um, <laughs> Good morning again. We're in this series called Hot Mess. We're in the last two weeks of it before we get into our Advent series. And uh, I thought we would just do again what we've been doing these last few weeks. If you're new with us, here's what we've been doing. We've been trying to read a verse out loud together so that we get what God wants from us in relationships, so that we deeply understand it. And so it's this first is this verse, first John. 4, 11 through 12, so it'll be up on the screen, and as it comes up on the screen, I'm going to say it, and then I'd like you to say it along with me. Uh, here we go. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Wow, it's like just little verses. Do you want God's love to be made complete in your life? And what kind of change would that make on your family, on your workplace, on your world? What kind of change would that make? And, and this, that's what this verse is saying. Because God's love for us is so great, when we love others, other people begin to see God. I love how it says that no one has ever seen God, but if you love one another, then his love is made complete in us. So let's do that. And, you know, the first villain is right off the bat, it's easier to apply biblical principles to people other than your spouse sometimes, isn't it? Isn't it easier sometimes to read the Bible and, and think of others like, oh, this family member, oh, this person at work, oh, this, and, and just sort of leapfrog over your spouse. But the reality is, is every verse you ever read in the Bible can be applied directly to your spouse as well, especially verses that you know, deal interpersonally with each other. So you read, you know, 1 John 4, you might think, oh, you know, like I said, there's people I go to church with, there's these people I need to love better, there's people at work that are bothering me, um, but it, it's, it's easiest to skip over those who are closest to us, and we don't want to do that. We want to apply the Bible to our own lives first, to our marriages first, to our kids first, to our own lives first, and God can do an incredible work through our lives through that. So today I want to talk about messy marriage. And in particular, um, I want to talk about the foundational beliefs of marriage that are in the Bible. And the reason why I want to talk about them is because messy marriages have messy foundations. And it's in cleaning up those foundational beliefs, it's in cleaning up the foundations that marriages become strong. Um, it, there was this house, uh, uh, many of you know uh, Pastor Tim Kirkus, who him and his wife Lisa Kirkus uh, were a part of this church for years and years and years. They're down, they were my friends down in Southern California. Uh, they still are my friends. Uh, for a while, they had th this parsonage, and they had this problem with this parsonage. They couldn't figure out. All these weird things kept happening with it. And it turned out the foundation was sinking. <laughs> when the foundation sinks in your house, that's a pretty bad deal right? You got to like jack the foundation up and sure up the foundation. And so in our marriages, it's the same deal. We have to have biblically foundational beliefs. 
And so one of the things you'll find out pretty quick about me, if you haven't found out about it already, is if you want to know where the foundation of any biblical thought is, turn with me to page one of the Bible. That's where we're going to be. So we're going to be in Genesis 1 and Genesis 3. We're going to be there for a few minutes this morning. So as you turn to Genesis 1, it would be 127 at first. There's this voice of... uh, there's this voice within the church that I want to confront. It's not our church in particular. It's the Big C Church. And there's many people that grew up hearing certain things about marriage in church that I I just directly want to confront today. And maybe at the end of today, I've ruffled your feathers and you're a little bit upset at me. That could be true. I don't know. It's just the Bible. So that's what I'm going to do today. It's just go through what the Bible has to say. Everything else is theology that man has overlaid onto it. So here's the, here's the foundational thoughts, that, the, the feathers I want to ruffle today. Many of you may have heard that women are to live in quiet submission to men. Many of you may have heard that women need to stay home, raise the children, women don't get a voice in the home, and that on the other side of this, that men are dominant leaders in the home. Um, the final say goes to man, uh, women's job is just to please their man, like, and maybe you've heard this talked about in a spiritual authority type of way. And the reality is, is just, that's not what the Bible says at all. This is not even close to what the Bible has to say. So Genesis 1, 27, 28 says this, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to him, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over every living creature and the ground. What we see in Genesis 1, 27 and 28 is this double theme uh, uh, that will traverse the entire Bible. Covenant, our image w- within God. Men and women equally bear the image of God. That's what we do. We equally bear this image that God created us as image bearers to the rest of creation. It's our covenant with him that we get that image. And then kingdom. It's the second, it, it's like a double helix DNA strand that weaves its way through the entire Bible. These verses set up a course for the whole rest of the Bible that, will, that you could just see in almost every verse. It's either a covenant or a kingdom verse. Kingdom is authority. So God made us in his image to rule, that word rule is very intentional here, over creation. So men and women are standing there, and the, and the picture you're supposed to get is they're standing side by side looking out to creation saying, this, I'm ruling this on behalf of God. I'm governing this on behalf of God. This is what God created man and woman to do quite equally. It's very clear to rule over all humanity. A couple weeks ago, it was when it was hot, because it gets cold here in Sacramento, but I I don't know how many of you knew that, but it's 90 degrees today in Southern California. You know, people are wearing shorts there. It's crazy. Um, But it was still hot, and I've got a pool, so I'm out. Uh, I'm like, I'm going to go skim my pool, because, you know, it was too cold to swim, but it's still pretty hot. And we find that there's just like tons of bees in our pool, just floating there. And my daughter has this sweet and tender heart, so she's rescuing all the bees, right? So she takes all the bees out of the pool, and she puts them in the sun. And, and Emma's like nursing these bees back to health, just like helping them to, to dry off, you know? And then once they're dried off, she's like taking a leaf and putting them on flowers, you know, so they could like get some pollen and live. Yeah, I don't know if they ever, if they lived after this. But I... What I said to her, I was like, Emma, do you get what you're doing? This is Genesis 1, 28. You are ruling over creation. You are showing these bees God's good image, God's goodness by rescuing them and bringing them to the flower. Like, that's what you're doing. And she was like, all right, whatever, Dad, I'm just saving some bees, you know? And, And but I was like, look at the biblical theological significance laid out in your life. And she's like, I don't care. But that's our job, is to rule over creation in a godly way. And most of you know the story. Adam and Eve sin, they corrupt this vision, right? That, that to rule over this together. And in Genesis 3, there's this whole list of curses. And, and you see that, like, you know, the serpent, oh, you're going to go on your belly, and the man, labor is going to be hard. And then he says this to the woman, Genesis 3.16, and this is where we get a lot of flawed beliefs that we have about marriage, and let's, read it, let's just look at it together right now. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. Sorry, ladies, shouldn't have eaten that fruit. Anyways. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. 
And then he says these two words or two verses that will divide Christians for years. The des- your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Now, this has been translated in a difficult way. This little passage shows the consequences of sin on the human relationship. The unfortunate thing about this verse is that it's been translated in, in a way sort of saying, been preached by some pastors saying that, see, the natural place is for men to rule over their wife. That's what it says in the dead, Genesis 3.16. Put that verse back up there, if you will. Je- look, Genesis 3.16, it says, uh, women, you're going to have this power struggle. You're going to want the power. You're going to want to be in charge. But really, it's the man that's going to rule over you. And so people have looked at this verse. Can you throw Genesis 3.16 back up on the screen, screen people? Thanks. Um, as we, we, Genesis 3.16 has been translated that way. Like, look at it. The Bible says, he will rule over you. So men have been like, yeah, that's my natural place, is to rule over my family, to rule over my spouse, to rule over all that. But it turns out the very best way to translate the Bible, and the very best way to interpret the Bible, is by using the Bible. What did God say humans were supposed to rule over? Anybody? Creation. Creation. Did God ever say, rule over one another? No, he didn't. In fact, what we're reading is a list of curses. That's what we're reading in the Bible. So people have taken Genesis 3.16 and have translated this to say, well, you know what, husbands, you're just in charge of your wives and, and you've got to rule over your spouse. And there's always going to be a power struggle in your marriage because she's going to want to rule over you. That's the sin of it all. But the reality is the whole thing is a curse. And unfortunately, uh, there's some very observant, or fortunately, there's some very observant commentators who have said people for generations have looked at this verse as a prescription for marriage, but the reality is that it's a description of a curse. It's actually the cursed way to live in marriage, to have power struggles over one another, to turn your attention inward and to fight and to want to be in charge and to all of that, rather than two co-equal people equally ruling over creation. That's the Genesis 1 picture. Sin corrupted everything, including marriage. If your marriage is a power struggle today, that's what the Bible calls a curse. That's what Genesis 3.16 is. So man, again, look at Genesis 1.28. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish and the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. The Bible never says rule over one another. The position of humanity is to rule over fish and animals and birds and all of creation. That's what the position of humanity is. And we look at Genesis 3. Some people have taught that it is creating a hierarchy within marriage and is just cannot be supported in the Bible. Let's look even further at man and woman in creation. Genesis 2 now. We're page 2 of the Bible. And by the way, some of you, this might be challenging to you. And I I totally get it because you come from a tradition where this is just taught completely the opposite of the way I've taught it. Come talk to me. It's fine. I'd love to have a conversation with you about the Bible. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. And I want to point out some key words in this, but I will in a second. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took out one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with the flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought it to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, for she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Let me talk about a few of the words that are in here. As first, it says, no suitable helper was found. Again, people have taken the words of the Bible and misused them for their own agenda within marriage. No suitable helper was found has been translated in the place that men or women were created just as helpers to men. Like, for example, Men, God knew you needed a secretary, so he gave you a wife. That is not true at all. That's just not what the Bible says. Well, the Bible says no suitable helper was found. This word helper, uh, if you want to really traverse it, again, 
the Bible is the best way to interpret the Bible. So look at the Bible. Where does this word helper come up again? It, it comes up in the Psalms. I look to the hills. Where does, my hill, where does my help come from? My helper is the Lord. It's a word for God. It's a word to describe God. God isn't subordinate to, to men, not even remotely. In fact, the reason why men needed a helper, ladies, you're going to love this, it, it, it points to the fact that we're inadequate to do the job on our own, right? And that you needed something extra. Now, it doesn't mean that men, it doesn't mean men that you are less than your wife. And women, it doesn't mean that you are greater than. And women, it doesn't mean that you're less than. And men, you're greater than. My point, and the only point I'm trying to make with all this, is that you two are equals. God created you as equal to operate together, to rule over the earth together. That's why God created you. Man's rib. Oh, many a joke about the rib of man and Adam and Eve and all that stuff. I can't tell you how many men's retreats I've been at, and then they tell that, the rib joke. And... Um, there's a lot, uh, you know, can you spare rib? Does anybody remember that joke? Anyways, um, I've heard the argument that women are less than because they are made out of the rib of a man. I, I just think this is hilarious that this is like an actual argument because the word rib actually isn't in Hebrew here. The word in Hebrew is half. So when you get a picture of Adam being like split, taken, you know, part of him being taken to build Eve, what God actually did is he cut man in half. He halved him and made Eve. And then they both came together. And it says this, and they became one flesh. What the text is saying is that men and women unite in marriage and through the sexual union come back together again as one flesh. The implication here is that it takes equals to unite. Also, in marriage, you are seen as one by God. You know that? In marriage, you are seen as one. God doesn't see one dominant and one submissive person, one dominant and one helper. God sees two equals together made in one flesh in marriage. Men and women, God created you as equals, created marriage to be enjoyed and celebrated among two equals. So the reason why I go through all this right now, and I know it's a lot of Genesis because we're like, aren't we talking about marriage? Yes. Messy marriages, this is a feeling, messy marriages have messy foundations. One last time, Genesis 3.16. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe with painful labor. You'll give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. So the point, if you read Genesis 3.16 and think, oh, I'm supposed to rule over my wife, you, you realize you're actually living in the cursed, uh, cursed life. That's what this is. It's, a, it's, a, it's in the list of curses the point is that this is a description of a curse rather than a prescription for marriage. If your marriage is based on a power struggle, you're living a cursed life. Messy marriages have messy foundations. And there's a lot of ways that cursed marriages play out. M women, maybe you put pressure on your husbands to do something w without them thinking about it. You put your words into their mouth and, and like they've got to go do your bidding for, for you. Like that's a way that you rule over your husband. The Bible says that's a curse. Men, maybe you do this, the same thing right. You don't allow your wife a decision, a, a voice in the finances. That's a curse. Men, maybe you are like, uh, you know what? I'm going to decide that uh, you're in charge of the kids and I get to peace out and go play video games uh, whenever I want. That's a curse for your wife. And it's going to be a curse for you in the bedroom later. Anyways, just throwing that out there. Women, <laughs> maybe you emasculate your husbands and belittle him to your friends. That's a curse. Men, maybe you use the cover of the Bible to take control over your wife. That's a curse, and using the Bible inappropriately. In marriage, when either person, this is a feeling again, begins to rule over the other, then marriage becomes a curse rather than a blessing, and it's meant to be fruitful and to multiply, to fill the earth and to subdue it. That's what marriage is meant to do. Marriage is meant to bring a family into this world and to, to continue bringing God's goodness into creation. That's the way it was set up from the garden. 
But sin makes us turn inward and say, how can I have power? How can I have control? Now, we're going to look at one of the most famous verses on marriage. It's Ephesians 5, and and we're going to look through all of that. And the reason why I want to look through some of this is because it uses language like men is the head of the spouse and I, or the woman. And I, I just want to confront that language directly because it's so powerful when you look at it in its context and what it actually is trying to say. But, you know, first we've got to talk about the Apostle Paul for a second. And I realize that some of you, like, you're like, I didn't show up for this sermon today. I, I showed up for the fun message on marriage. But we've got to get into the nitty gritty before we get into the fun other stuff like that. I, I love not anybody love Nacho Libre? Anybody else? Is it just me? It's like, let's get into the nitty gritty. Anybody? Okay. I just had that, that quote fall through my head. Anyways, now before we read Paul, we have to understand something about Paul. Paul did this. Paul was a religious Jew who was like steeped in the ways of Judaism. And one of the things that he did is when he saw Jesus and wrote about Jesus, he saw Jesus as reversing the curse. Paul is the, like, kind of the first author on what we'd call creation theology. Paul looked at everything in relation to the garden. That's what he did. If you begin to read through his text and ask how many garden references is Paul making, you're going to realize that Paul goes back to Genesis 1 through 3 all the time. He is constantly going back there all the time. And so in Genesis 15, like, here's a, Gen- I mean, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, all over the place in 1 Corinthians 15, but just one verse, he says this, just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. Now, that's just a, a random example, because I just wanted an example of how he goes back into the garden. And, and he even says, for as in Adam all die, and in Christ, all are made alive. He constantly goes back to the garden because he sees that as God's original intention for humanity. And so he'll always just go back there. So what he's saying is like, hey, we bore the image of this sinful man out of the garden, but guess what? Through Jesus Christ, we get to reverse that curse, the curse of Adam, and we get the image of God. That's what we get. This is what Paul is always going to do through everything that Paul writes is go back to creation theology. Some guys way smarter than me have pointed that out to me. It's really incredible. So as we go to Ephesians 5, there's a few things that you might need to know going into Ephesians 5. One is this. There were something called Greco-Roman marriage codes that happened. That just like you got married, you signed on the dotted line, uh, that you understood that there were household codes. And for those codes, this is what it would look like if you were getting married in first century uh, Rome, and this was not a Christian marriage. The marriage codes would be something like this. Men, you have absolute dominance and control over your spouse. Men, if you feel the need, you could go sleep with any temple prostitute you'd like to. Men, if you are, you know, you have all freedom, all control, everything. Women, your job is kids, washing the clothes, preparing the food, spot cleaning the laundry, ironing the clothes. Your job is domestic household chores. And you have no voice, you don't get to speak up over your husband, and your husband can divorce you if he is just unpleased with you. Like, those were the basic household codes, and those were prolific. Everyone knew about these. So Paul writes to this church in Ephesus, and he's talking to them because they're steeped in these household codes. And he, what he does is he writes Ephesians 5, the most amazing marriage passage of all time, and he flips these household codes on their head. So let's get into it right now. Ephesians 5, we're going to go, starting in verse 21. It is clear between 20, chapter 20 in the Greek, uh, verse 20 and 21, that Paul is starting a brand new thought. And this new thought begins to talk about marriage. And it's, it starts with this. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Everybody gets upset in the, in the marriage ceremony um, the, the marriages I've done, women are like, am I going to have to say I'm going to submit to him? And I say, no, you're both going to have to say you submit to each other because that's what marriage is. It's this process of laying yourself down for your spouse. Paul is taking married people back to the garden because that's what they did in the garden. 
They yielded authority to one another because their authority was never meant to be over one another. It was meant to be over creation. And that's what Paul is doing. One of the problems that people have with Christianity is this word submit in marriage. But what they don't see is that the Bible calls both men and women to submit to each other in unity. They don't see this, unfortunately, because it's so rare in Christian marriages. Do I need to say that again? They don't see the joy and beauty of submitting to one another out of reference for Christ because it's so rare in Christian marriages. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Ephesians 5.22 Wives, submit to your husbands as to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he's the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, also wives should submit to their own husbands in everything. So Paul comes to define submission a little bit later on in this text that we haven't read yet as the word respect. It's, it's actually a fill in your notes. Submission for wives is defined as respect, and that's verse 22 and verse 33. What Paul is saying here is, wives, give honor to your husbands. Why? Because men, you have the far harder job in marriage. You might be equal together, like God has created you equal, but men, you got to be men here. You got harder jobs in marriage than women do. I'm just telling you right now because what we're about to read. In one sense, like I said, you're equal, but men, your responsibility is larger. The Bible expects men, and this is a fill-in, men to be like Jesus to their spouse. The Bible expects men to be like Jesus to their spouse. See, respect for women, ladies, the, Paul calls you to respect your husbands. And that's a response. That's a response out of the crazy love that your husband has for you. The sacrificial, self-giving love. The only rational response is to respect your husband. It would be completely and irrationally crazy if you didn't respect your husband because he loved you like Jesus loves the church. So the Bible expects men to be like Jesus to their spouse. See, this is where people look and say, see, men get to rule over women. Just as Jesus is the head of the church, men is the head of women. That's what the Bible said, right? Jesus, men, you're the head. The problem is here, when we read this with 21st century eyes, we miss a lot. We look at the word head as dominant leader. But Paul actually had words available to him. He had words like apostle, which was a military term, and he used all the time. He talked about leadership with Timothy and used all sorts of leadership words about being in charge and being the dominant leader and all that. Like Paul uses these words freely in other gospels, but here he says head. And what does that mean? If you were to read this back in the first century, you probably would have read the word source. Men is the source of women. In other words, women derive from men just as Christ derived from the church. I mean, other way around. Just as the church derived from Christ. So that, that's the point. In, Paul is using creation theology again. Women were derived from men just as Christ, um, just as the church was derived from Jesus. The problem is that we look at this phrase as husbands, as the head of the wife, and people have built entire theologies on this one phrase. They even built entire gender roles surrounding this. Now pay attention to the way that Paul defines headship for men. Ladies, you're going to get a kick out of this. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. To make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as in their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one had ever hated their own body, but they fed and cared for their body, just as Christ does the church. For we are all members of this body. Remember how I said there was Roman household codes of what women had to do. What Paul is doing here is taking the Roman household codes for women and applying it to what male headship looks like. It's a complete and utter flip on its head. People reading this in Rome in the first century in Ephesus 
would have been like, <gasps> what? Do you, uh, what are you asking the man to do? A list of female domestic chores? That's horrible. They would have been so upset with this. I mean, think about it. Men, you're the head of uh, women. Okay, here's what that looks like. Wash her. Do the dishes. <laughs> spot clean. No, no spot. No wrinkle. Got to do some ironing. Paul is taking this list of female domestic chores and saying, okay, men, this is what it looks like to love and submit and surrender to your wife. It doesn't mean you got to, this is not really a real list of chores in the Bible, just so you know. So women, if you hear from me today that your husband should go home and do the dishes, that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> You're like, well, Pastor Dave said, you are like, we're not going to that church anymore. <laughs> Why does Paul do this? Because he's looking out at the entire secular Roman world and seeing marriage that is an absolute curse to those in it. And he has a desire and he sees that Jesus' death and resurrection takes us back to the garden, brings us back to that authority. He knows that Jesus at the center of your marriage can break the curse of sin. Seeing leave it, living in a marriage out in Ephesians 5 is a way to refuse to rule over one another. If you live out Ephesians 5, then what you're going to do is you're going to refuse to have this power struggle in your marriage. And you're going to say, no, 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 we're not going to fight about this. We're not going to have a power struggle. We're going to talk together about ways in which we could do this together. And we're going to go as a team, as a unified front. Guys, it means you sacrificially love your wife just in the same way that Jesus loved the church. See, this is the harder job for men because what did Jesus do for the church? He died for the church. Yeah. Guys, are you ready? Will you give your life for your spouse? Are you ready to do that? Do you love her in such a way that you would just give everything for her? This is what Paul is calling the church to do in their marriages. This is what it means to sacrificially love your wife in the same way that Jesus loves you. Men, be willing to lay down your life for your wife. And women, if you don't respect that, it, you, you, they're, that's crazy, right? Like that's kind of sacrificial love. The only rational and true response to that sacrificial love is to respect that. So this is why it says men love your wives, women respect your husbands. And Paul loves to take this all back to Genesis 1 by saying, man is the head of wife. Uh, and I think probably it means that he's, he's held responsible over all this. And then it gets to 531. And this is the pinnacle of this verse. It says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Whoa. Paul just went back to Genesis chapter 2. The two becoming one flesh. Paul's talking about married couples submitting to one another sexually. Marriages are a mess because physical touch is neglected. The Bible is clear. It's through sexual intimacy within marriage that unity is achieved. That's how the two become one flesh. It's through regular sexual intimacy that you begin to lay down your desire to rule over one another and see yourselves as equals. Church, I know Christian couples who haven't been together intimately in months or maybe they just have a day once a month it's like that's for intimacy that's a recipe for disaster in marriage sex is god's gift to married people and it ought to be enjoyed freely and regularly within your marriage guys are like all right we're going to church again <laughs> <laughs> i like this guy now <laughs> honey we're going to church Why? Ephesians 5, 32. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself. The wife also must respect her husband. See, in verse 32, Paul is saying, all of this is a profound mystery, but the way that you act and the way that you live in marriage actually reveals the gospel. Men, when you love your wife sacrificially, you are showing this world, your family, your kids, especially your kids, what Jesus looks like. 
And women, when you respect your husband for that, you're showing your kids, you're showing your family, you're showing your workplace, you're showing them all what the church looks like. A logical response to that sort of love. You are showing it off. You put the gospel on display. Do you put the gospel on display in your marriage? Friends, your marriage, it's really got two options. One, you could live out the curse in your marriage and you can say, I'm dominant over you. I get the final say. You don't get a word in. This is just me. This is, you know, take it or leave it. That's what marriage is going to look like. Or you could come to each other as equals. You could surrender your desire to rule over one another and ask God to bless you in your marriage to live the way that Ephesians 5 calls us to live, to live the way that Genesis 1 and 2 calls us to live in marriage. I want to invite you that Jesus is a curse breaker. He breaks the curse of sin from Genesis 3. He breaks all these curses. Maybe in your marriage you're trying to rule over one another and it's just like turned out to be a cursed marriage. There's a different way, the way of Jesus. Parents especially, a strong marriage that reflects Jesus matters. You know, I, it, it occurred to me this week, I was talking with Heather, our children's director, and I was thinking, you know what? We can put on a thousand children's programs for your kids. We can put on a children's program once a day for a year, and none of that will have as lasting effect on your children's lives than a marriage that honors Jesus. None of it will have as good of an effect on their lives as you loving your wife, men, and women, you respecting your husbands. We, we can't even touch that discipleship. We, we tend to think that we're pretty decent at children's ministry here. We're, we're, we do pretty good. But we, we can't even touch what you do at home. What you do at home is so much more powerful and so much more effective than we could ever do here on a Sunday. And, and we want to even do better and more with children's ministry. But the reality is this. Your marriage disciples your children far better than we can ever disciple them. So what's it going to be? What's it going to be for your marriage? And the most powerful thing that you could do for your kids and for the legacy of your family is to live out a fully surrendered marriage to Jesus and to one another. Just in case... I wasn't practical enough. I wanted to leave you with the three T's, I think, of a healthy marriage. Just, just the last bit, because I know we had to get theological today. I know we had to dig deep in the Bible and we had to confront some stuff that maybe, uh, you know, I know that's just out there in culture. But I want to talk about the three T's of a, of a great marriage, and that is this. Married couples, spend time together. Do, spend time together. You work a lot. Carve out inven- in, intentional time together. Spend time together. Two, talk with one another. It's, it's shocking to me how many married couples don't talk to each other. Or just talk about, like, you, you can see what you talk about, what your marriage is. Is it just a business relationship? We just talk about money? We just talk about the stuff we're going to do? Or do you really talk to one another? So married couples, you, I, I'm, this is homework for you, okay? So if you're married here today, this is your homework. Spend time together. Talk to together. And then, guys, you're going to like the third one. Touch. Touch each other. Marriages need these three T's. Time, talk, touch. They need them. It, it, it's like gasoline in your car. It's like, it's like if you, all right, maybe you have a Tesla. It's like plugging your car in. You know, it's like, it's the power that your car needs from one another. Time, talk, touch. Married people, your marriage matters. And, and we're not willing to let that go. Your marriage matters. And the reason why it matters is because we have a broken world and your marriage ought to put the gospel on display. Men, how can you, how can you love your wife? I want you leaving today thinking, how can I love my wife better? Women, I want you leaving today thinking, how, could, how can my life, how can our family life change if I just respected my husband more? Marriage is part of God's plan to reach this world and it becomes messy it becomes messy when we begin to try and rule over one another. It becomes messy when we don't submit to one another. It becomes messy in these ways when we think that we ought to have all the power. So married people, here's what I want to do. I realize we've been asking a lot of people to stand today. I'm going to do it again. If you're married and you're with your spouse today, would you stand up? 
I want to pray over you and your spouse this morning. And my wife's right here, so I'll, I'll pray over us as well. Grab the hand of your spouse. And if you're not married, you know, we'll, we'll talk about you too at one point. Don't worry. You're, we're not trying to leave you out. We want to invite you to pray over the married people as well. So let's do that. Lord, would you give the men of REC eyes to see their spouse as equals? God, would you give men of, the men of REC the courage to be like you and to love their wife sacrificially? God, would you give the men of REC the same love that your son Jesus has for the church, for his wife and for his kids? And Father, would you give women the, this, the same love that they have, that, that, that you have for the church as well? God, would they mutually surrender to one another? Would you give women this divine power to respect their husbands? And Lord, would you be with the marriages of REC, God, because we know that your will for marriage is to put the gospel on display, that you loved us, you died for us, you cleansed us, and you washed us, oh God. We know that's your will through marriage. And so, Lord, we pray that these marriages would grow powerfully effective in your kingdom. God, that marriages would last. God, there might be some couples here today thinking that this might not work out. Lord, we pray that you would break the power of any curse that is on their marriage. Any desire to rule over one another, that you would break that power. And that you would give us all the power to surrender to our spouses in a loving way so that we see you right in the middle. Maybe you're here today and you're a married couple and you just need to just whisper to each other, Jesus, we put you at the center of our marriage. Jesus, we put you at the center of our marriage. Help us, oh God, to show our families what it looks like to follow you, to show our families what you really look like. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen.